trait theory center around the view that criminality is a product of abnormal biological or psychological traits. We looked at biological theories last week. This week we cover psychological theories. The main areas we'll look at are intelligence, personality, cognitive development, and learning, which we'll cover next week. Let's begin right off the bat with the most controversial, intelligence. Does intelligence predict crime? And more specifically, low intelligence. This idea of an intelligence crime link has been around for a long time and is tied closely to the nature-nurture debate. As we discussed at length last week with biological theories, this originated largely due to beliefs of racial and ethnic inferiority, including prejudice against blacks specifically, and a strong anti-immigrant sentiment in the U.S. in the late 1800s and early 1900s. It was tied to the belief that blacks and immigrants, particularly those coming from Ireland, Italy, and Germany at the time, were feeble-minded, had lower intelligence, were weak, and more likely to be criminal, therefore not suitable for society. This nature theory argues that intelligence is largely determined genetically. Low intelligence leads to criminality. On the flip side, the nurture theory argues that intelligence is not inherited, but is largely a product of the environment. Low intelligence does not itself cause crime, but instead may result from the same environmental factors that do cause crime. Intelligence is assessed using what is known as an intelligence quotient, or IQ test. Many intelligence studies were conducted on populations of known offenders in the early 1900s identifying a link between IQ and crime. However, criminologist Edwin Sutherland, who we'll talk more about next week, evaluated these early studies on the IQ crime link in 1931 by comparing the IQ scores among the offenders tested with those of army draftees, who were considered representative of the general population, and found them to be virtually identical. He also identified inconsistent application of IQ tests. Many different tests have been developed over the years, and a lack of standardization has been a problem historically, and poor methodologies in the studies. Therefore, he dismissed the idea of an IQ crime link, which became widely accepted in criminology for decades. This debate was reignited, though, in the late 1970s when criminologists Travis Hershey and Michael Hindelung suggested IQ is at least as important in predicting crime as socioeconomic status. They proposed that low IQ in juveniles caused poor performance in school, which was linked with decreased opportunities and therefore was related to both juvenile delinquency and criminality as an adult. The most controversial publication in this area undoubtedly was The Bell Curve, written by Richard Hernstein and Charles Murray in 1994. They argued that the outcomes for youth who were at risk for crime were largely determined by their intelligence. Low IQ youth are more likely to commit crime, get caught, sent to prison, whereas high IQ youth are protected by their higher intelligence, allowing them to succeed in school and build key social relationships to avoid criminal behavior. Even more controversial were explicit connections made between intelligence and race, along with policy recommendations such as cutting off social assistance from women with low IQs to discourage them from having children and reducing immigration from poorer countries, primarily those with mostly non-white populations, because their lower intelligence made them unlikely to succeed in the U.S. The book was widely read, heavily influenced views on race, intelligence, and criminality, including public policy, received widespread backlash from the scientific community, and, needless to say, remains highly controversial to this day, as does the IQ crime link in general. There are several notable criticisms worth highlighting. One was just covered, that is basically a cover for racial and ethnic prejudice, and at worst, a throwback to social engineering of eugenics. To this point, IQ tests have also been criticized for being ethnocentric, created by scientists in Western culture to assess individuals in that culture. Poor performance on these tests by those from non-Western cultures should then be expected, just as individuals in Western cultures would be expected to perform poorer on IQ tests developed in non-Western cultures. Instead, though, it was long concluded that the results were due to poor intelligence rather than a poorly conceived, culturally biased testing instrument. Another criticism is that intelligence does not explain changes and patterns in crime. Individuals tend to age out of crime as they get older. Can this be explained just by getting smarter over time? 
Of course, as we've previously discussed, this applies only to street crime. Are those who commit white-collar and corporate crime of lower intelligence too? Certainly, many of these crimes require at least some level of higher intelligence to pull off. What about ecological crime patterns? Does intelligence fluctuate based on the weather, time of year, time of day, and geographic location? And finally, self-report studies consistently find that the vast majority, upwards of 90%, of juveniles commit some type of criminal offense at some point. Do all of these youths have low IQs? Or is it just those who are caught? Which, if so, comes with its own set of implications. So that's just a general overview of the intelligence crime debate, some of its criticisms and controversies. Moving on, let's now turn to personality, emotional or behavioral attributes that distinguish one person from another that are reasonably stable or constant over different situations and scenarios. One of the more well-known personality theories was proposed in the mid-20th century by Hans Eysenck, who argued personality is a function of arousal levels based in the central nervous system, which impacts the individual's ability to adapt to the environment. The two main dimensions are on continuums between neuroticism and stability and extroversion and introversion. Neuroticism stability is how individuals respond emotionally to what happens in the environment. Is the individual more easily anxious or upset by environmental stressors or calmer and more collected? Extroversion introversion is a level of preference for external stimulation. Extroverts are more outgoing and energetic. Introverts are more reserved, keep to themselves. Those who are more on the extreme ends of either extroversion or introversion, while also being highly neurotic, are thought to be more prone to criminal behavior. These ideas were later adapted by several other psychologists over the years into what became known as the Big Five Personality Traits, which in addition to neuroticism and extroversion also include openness to new ideas, experiences, and adventures, agreeableness, cooperating with and doing things for others, and conscientiousness, preparing, paying attention, staying on task. Different variations on these traits have been associated with antisocial behavior, antisocial being a general term indicating a lack of consideration for how our actions impact others, as well as aggression, which are also linked with criminal behavior. Another personality theory linked to criminal behavior is Robert Hare's psychopathy checklist, originally developed in the 1970s and adapted several times in the years since. Some of the common traits of psychopathy include a lack of empathy, lack of guilt or remorse for harming others, insincerity, pathological lying, superficial charm, egotistical and narcissistic, a grandiose sense of self-worth, superficial intelligence, thinking you're smarter than everyone else, impulsive and irresponsible, and even a lowered response to pain and fear. The combination of these traits is thought to make a person more prone to criminal behavior, particularly violence. Indeed, high scores in this checklist have been disproportionately found among prisoners and also among corporate executives, which is one of the many explanatory factors for white collar and corporate crime. However, psychopathy has been criticized for being too closely tied to criminality, essentially identifying common traits found among criminals and using them to describe something else, a psychopath, essentially resulting in a tautology, rendering it with little applicable value. It's also important to note that psychopathy is not a designated mental disorder according to the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And there is a great deal of confusion among laypersons and professionals alike between psychopathy and sociopathy, the inability to empathize with other people, and antisocial personality disorder, which is in the DSM and is more commonly used today. This isn't something we're going to spend a great deal of time digging into here, but is something you should be aware of. This leads us to other mental disorders and illnesses that have been linked with criminal behavior. Schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, mood disorders, conduct disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, which was mentioned last week, among others. While we can identify these disorders, it's difficult to assess their origins. Are they genetic? Are they the result of trauma? physical trauma to the brain, or a traumatic childhood and upbringing. In other words, is it ultimately learned behavior, such as in an abusive home? And they correspond with other problems, a lack of financial resources, use of substances as self-medication, and difficulty with social interactions. 
All of this makes it more likely that a person with a mental disorder will be arrested as they may seem like a potential danger to themselves or others when they may not be. There is certainly a lack of police training on how to appropriately handle someone going through a mental health crisis. This gives a distorted impression that those with mental disorders are more likely to be criminal. And it's important to note that the vast majority of individuals with these disorders do not engage in crime. Those who suffer from mental illness are much more likely to be the victim of crime rather than the perpetrator. Now, let's rewind a bit and look at another set of explanations for personality that will also lead into theories of cognitive development. Psychodynamic theories. Psychodynamics set the early foundation for psychological theories, originating in the late 1800s to early 1900s with the work of Sigmund Freud. His original psychodynamic theory was psychoanalysis, which was used as a way to treat mental illness, but also as a way to explain human behavior by going all the way back to how elements of personality developed in early childhood. He argued we are driven by our unconscious drives and desires, and that elements of our personality develop as a way to restrict or rein them in. According to Freud, there are three parts of the mind, the conscious, the preconscious, and the unconscious. The conscious is what we're currently aware of and actively thinking about, our present thoughts, perceptions, feelings, memories, and fantasies. Preconscious is our available memory, information that is quickly accessible, such as a birth date. We can easily bring it forward, but it's not always actively in our thoughts. The unconscious is the largest part of the mind that we are largely unaware of and cannot readily be accessed by the conscious mind. Our drives, desires, motivations, instincts, traumas, stresses. It is the thought processes, memory, and motivation that occur automatically without our knowing. Traumatic and painful repressed memories and emotions, socially unacceptable ideas and desires. When you have a natural reaction to something that you immediately suppress and can't really figure out why it came up in the first place, that's the unconscious. Freud also identified different components of an individual's personality, known as the id, ego, and superego. The id is instinct, instinctual drives, impulses, desires. It is the largest component present in all of us at birth that wants immediate satisfaction. It is the pure pleasure principle. I want it and I want it now. The ego is reality, or what we come to accept as reality. It is the face we put on for the rest of the world, corresponding most closely with the conscious part of the mind. Ego is concerned with the rational pursuit of pleasure, finding the easiest path to fulfillment. It begins to emerge at around the age of two as a check on the id. The superego is the ethical moral center of the brain, the conscience tells us what to do, what not to do. The internalization of punishment, reward, warning, shame, guilt, and pride. The id and superego create constant tension in our lives, which is balanced out by the ego. Behavioral problems arise when there is an imbalance in components of the personality, namely among the ego or superego. The id was not the problem, it was considered a constant, always there, it is what it is, never too strong or too weak. But an underdeveloped superego, for instance, won't be able to suppress the id, meaning rewards and punishments associated with appropriate behavior won't be internalized, and empathy and guilt won't be established. On the flip side, an overdeveloped superego may lead to an excess of conscience, like constant feelings of guilt and anxiety, a latent need or desire to be caught and punished for doing something wrong. Or, a weak ego can lead to immaturity, poor social skills, problems in school, and following others into delinquent and criminal behavior or substance use. These imbalances stem from not reaching new stages of development in early childhood. We're not going to go over these stages in Freud's conception or Freud's many other theories, many of which are quite controversial, especially those associated with sexual development, but it's important to note the crucial role of early psychodynamic theories in laying the foundation for understanding understanding personality along with cognitive development. These theories focus on how our behavior is influenced by the processes of individual reasoning, which are influenced by the way we perceive our environment. They look at how people perceive and mentally represent the world around them and solve problems. The value of these theories is in showing why criminal behavior patterns change over time as people mature and develop their own powers of reasoning, which may help explain the aging out process. Let's first look at Jean Piaget's four stages of cognitive development in children. First is the sensory motor stage, birth to two years old, where children are taking in a tremendous amount of basic information, learning through basic actions of movement and sensation, and how their actions can cause things to happen to the world around them. 
The next stage is pre-operational, two to seven, when children begin thinking using language and symbols to represent objects. They are highly egocentric, with themselves at the center of the world, concentrating on the most obvious aspect of what is going on in front of them and struggling to see things from others' perspectives. At the concrete operational stage, 7 to 11, thinking becomes more decentered. Children can look beyond themselves to begin to think in more non-abstract, concrete terms. More logical and organized, but still focused on things they've already seen or experienced. And they begin to use inductive reasoning, connecting specific observations to more general ideas. And the final stage is formal operational, ages 12 and beyond, where thinking becomes more abstract and the ability to use deductive reasoning, general to specific, is developed, including understanding theoretical reasons behind hypothetical problems such as moral, philosophical, ethical, social, and political challenges, and come up with and assess different possible options in their minds. Piaget also noted the different ways we process information. Assimilation is when we take in new information information in terms of what is already known, pre-existing knowledge and beliefs. Accommodation is when we adjust, change, or alter what we previously knew in light of new information. And equilibration is a balance between assimilation and accommodation. This is how children move from one stage to the next. Piaget's theory was later adapted by Lawrence Kohlberg to focus on the development of individual conceptualizations of morality and justice, which could be used to explain decisions either to conform to or violate the law. Kohlberg's theory of moral development has three levels, with two steps in each level. The first level is pre-conventional, early and middle childhood, where children learn what is acceptable behavior from external influences. They are told what is right and wrong. This is when children learn obedience through the introduction of rewards and punishments. Children learn to develop an orientation of their own self-interests and evaluate how they can avoid punishment and gain rewards. Stage 1, to avoid punishment. Stage 2, to gain a reward. We'll come back to this again next week when we talk about conditioning. The second level is conventional, late childhood, early adolescence, a combination of external and internal influences on behavior. Stage three is about peer acceptance, wanting to be accepted and liked by others and avoid disapproval or dislike from others. And stage four is learning obedience to social norms and laws, acting in a way to conform with what is established as acceptable and avoid behaviors that violate the law. The final level is post-conventional, which occurs in late adolescence, young adulthood, or for some people, maybe never. This is where a sense of morality is internalized. Young adults begin to consider their worldview in light of their own moral compass. Stage 5 centers on individual rights. Is something I do going to violate the rights of others? And then finally, stage 6 is the development of conscience based on a universal or quote-unquote real truth that distinguishes right from wrong. This goes beyond accepting the law as written. What if the law is fundamentally wrong, immoral, harmful, unjust? Am I still going to follow it? This is where civil disobedience comes into play. So, at different stages, at different levels, criminal behavior can result from an individual not developing the capacity to make moral judgments by not progressing to the next stage of moral development. We'll build on these ideas when we address social learning theories next week. To conclude, there are numerous strengths and limitations of psychological explanations of crime. They can help us understand development, learning, change, decision-making, and maturation. They account for both internal and social influences, and they provide some useful tools for categorizing individuals, for retrospective explanations of behavior after it occurs, and for gauging the risk of reoffending. However, they have numerous limitations as well. First, they aren't very useful for making predictions on who is or is not likely to commit crime. While accounting for both individual and social influences, there is no process to explain the mix of these different causal factors. What actually has to occur that triggers criminal behavior? And why do so many people who have the same psychological traits end up not engaging in crime? There is also an issue of testability. How do we test whether psychology was a primary causal factor? There are many tests available, but they require the subjective interpretation of raters assessing another person's behavior. And then finally, and this may be more of a challenge as opposed to a limitation, if psychological theories do indeed explain crime, then the solution is treatment. Therapy of some what kind. kind of, but what kind of therapy? And does it work? Who should it be given to? And when? Before or after crimes have been committed? 
a good argument could be made that we should all be in therapy of some kind to better understand ourselves and why we behave the way we do. While this may have some positive impact on all sorts of psychological and broader social problems, mandating universal therapy isn't exactly a realistic solution. So there are many important questions here to be considered, and that's all for this week. Next week, we'll move more into social explanations of crime, beginning with social learning, social control, and social reaction. Have a good one.